Hello, well, welcome to lecture four for Psych 4981. And this week's lecture, as you can see, is going to be about William James and the school of psychology that's associated with him called functionalism. So after I've talked a little bit about James, I'm going to also focus then on some of the people who followed William James. I want to begin, though, by talking about a sort of a precursor to William James. And that that precursor, I mean, it involves William James, but it's known as the Metaphysical Club. And the Metaphysical Club was a group of young, Harvard-educated, well-to-do Bostonians that met in the early 1870s. There's only four or five of them at any given time, and they would just get together and have chats and discuss philosophical ideas. And as you can see, a book came out, oh, probably about 15 years ago now, called The Metaphysical Club, A Story of Ideas in America, by Louis Menand. And this book talks about the origins of the Metaphysical Club and why it's important uh, for understanding how ideas in America in the 20th century kind of took off. The Metaphysical Club is interesting, especially given what I talked about in the last lecture about the rise of things like Scottish common sense philosophy and the rise of the business individualism of America and these other trends that I reviewed in the last lecture. And you remember that the way I ended the last lecture was talking about sort of a perfect example of this was Orson and Lorenzo Fowler and the way they did their phrenology business and set it up as a way to make a lot of money and they could give lectures and uh, kind of got people excited about this because it had a lot of practical aspects to it. So in the context of that happening, um, we have the Metaphysical Club. So I want to tell you about this Metaphysical Club and tell you about a little bit about the um, people that were in it. The Metaphysical Club started up after World, uh, sorry, after the Civil War. And that's important to keep in mind because these people were in Boston and the North won the American Civil War. And the problem was that even though they won, they weren't very victorious because the country was sort of in ruins after the Civil War. And most of the members of the Metaphysical Club had had relatives that had been injured or were killed in the Civil War. And the Civil War had had just a, you know, a scarring effect on American life. And so a lot of the younger people after the Civil War were quite, quite disillusioned about humanity and about society and about the future of America. And so these people in the Metaphysical Club sort of got together to kind of hash over these feelings and thoughts they had post-Civil War. They were roughly in the age of maybe 30 to 40. So they weren't you know, fresh out of university or something. They're in their 30s mainly. Um, but let's go ahead and just talk about a little bit about it. So one of the things you're going to learn about, and I'm going to talk about it um, a few times today, is pragmatism. So pragmatism was an important component of the meta metaphysical club. That's sort of their core philosophy. And this pragmatism then filters into William James's psychology. So I'll talk more about that in a moment. I'm also going to talk about Charles Saunders Pierce, who um, was a member of the Metaphysical Club and was a, a famous philosopher in his own right, who had a big influence on William James's thinking. And so we'll talk about him. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about why this was also revolutionary. OK, so moving on. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the members of the Metaphysical Club. So it was in the early 1870s, and one of the members was Oliver Wendell Holmes, the person that's pictured here. You can see in 1872, he was about 31. And the reason why Oliver Wendell Holmes is kind of important is that he actually goes on in his life to become a distinguished justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. In fact, there are many famous judicial decisions that happened in the 20th century that have to do with Oliver Wendell Holmes being on the Supreme Court. So here he is, a still young man, met a member of the Metaphysical Club. And so some of his later judicial decisions reflect the influence of being in the Metaphysical Club. Another person was Chauncey Wright. You can see he was a bit older. So in 1870, he was already 40. He actually had already been giving lectures on psychology at Harvard. He was very familiar with Wilhelm Wundt's work and some other psychologists at the time. So he was already talking about psychology. He also was a lecturer in mathematical physics at Harvard, and he was doing that near the end of his life in 1875. So the reason why I bring that up is just that it was sort of natural for him to be talking about psychology, philosophy, and meta meta mathematical physics. It all kind of went together in a person like him. Unfortunately, he died at the age of 45 of a stroke, so he was fairly young when he passed away. Then there's this philosopher, Charles Peirce, 
Um, this is an undated photo, so I don't really know what he looked like in the early 1870s. You could consider him to be a philosopher. He would have considered himself to be a logician, so he was really an expert on logic and developed a lot of the uh, philosophy of logic. And he was also a mathematician. Um, many people consider him to be the most original thinker and the greatest logician of his time. So he's a very important philosopher. In fact, one of the kind of outputs of his, of his work was he developed logic of circuits turning on and off, um, you know, because you could, you could have a circuit that made a light go on or off. And he kind of took this combinations of circuits and started thinking about how if you turn them on and off, how that could uh, be the basis uh, for logic. And then that those writings and that, that kind of thinking of logic about circuits turning on and off became the basis of digital computers many decades later. Then we have um, William James, who was the final member. And you can see here, William James lived from 1842 to 1910. We're going to talk more about James, of course, in this lecture, but I just want to point out that he fits in here. He's part of the Metaphysical Club. Now, the core philosophy of the Metaphysical Club uh, was that a person's beliefs evolve just as a species do. And they call this pragmatism. That as you mature, your beliefs compete for acceptance so that adequate beliefs emerge from the survival of the fittest among our original beliefs. Beliefs are important only insofar as they produce behavior. So that's pragmatism. That's the core philosophy of the metaphysical club. That you have these beliefs and as you get older, you're always changing your beliefs. They're competing for acceptance. And basically the ones that you end up with at the age of 30 or 50 or 70 are the ones that survived among your original beliefs that you had maybe when you were much younger because they produced behavior that led to some consequences. And so it's kind of saying that we basically are all pragmatic in the sense that we hold on beliefs that give us behavior and that behavior you know, will help us live It'll help us be successful. So we kind of choose among our beliefs where they, the beliefs fight themselves out in order to produce successful behavior so that you live. Um, William James said, for instance, that my thinking is first, last, and always for the sake of my doing. So they always believed that beliefs or cognitions or ideas were always connected to behavior. So it doesn't really matter if you have a belief if you can't connect it to a behavior. Um, those kind of beliefs that don't have any connection to the behavior are just sort of idle. They don't really um, have much merit. So they were only really concerned about the kinds of ideas that would lead to behaviors. They also believed that no belief could ever be held with absolute certainty. So that's a real important difference from other philosophers before them. The best that humans could hope for were beliefs that led to successful action in the world. And so they believe that their beliefs were constantly struggling for acceptance. So, you know, whatever beliefs you have right now might be different from a year from now. And that would have to do with the fact that we can't really ever hold them with absolute certainty. Charles Peirce wrote about this and how to make our ideas clear in 1878. He said, the whole function of thought is to produce habits of action. What we call beliefs are a rule of action or say for short, a habit. So again, Here's that connection between thought and behavior. And so the whole function of us to have ideas or to have thoughts is to have habits, to have behaviors that we're going to engage in that are the ones that lead us to the most success. And I keep saying success, but I mean like the success could be in terms of finding the right partner or the uh, getting food or whatever it happens to be that you need to have success about. And so he argued that the rule for attaining clear ideas is that you needed to consider what effects your ideas have for practical life. So that's how you know if you have a clear idea is you have to kind of think it through in terms of what its consequence is going to be if you adopt that particular idea or behavior, uh, sorry, idea or belief, because it will lead to a behavior. And that's how you decide which ideas are the best. So that was kind of the metaphysical club and they got together on a regular basis and would have discussions in the 1870s and influence each other. And as I said, all of these members of the Metaphysical Club went on to do great, important things in American intellectual life. And you can see, perhaps maybe now that some of you have read William James, um, you can kind of maybe see how William James comes from this and how he's influenced by the Metaphysical Club. I want to just address this question about why was this revolutionary? Like, why was it so 
important that you had the metaphysical club. Well, some important things you might have noticed if you compared it to some of the other philosophers that we briefly covered in this semester is that, for instance, it abandons ancient foundations of philosophy, things like native truths, that we have these truths that are self-evident and that we're born with. No, it's saying that all of our beliefs are tenuous, that they're just basically the ones that work best for the current situation we're in. And so you can see then the second point here is that it draws then from Darwin's work that the best beliefs work in adapting us to our changing environment. So it has this evolutionary field and all of the uh, members of the metaphysical club were strong Darwinian believers. They had all read Darwin's work, were all promoters of Darwin's theory of evolution. So they took this notion that comes from evolution and just said this works with our beliefs as well, that we all of us are in, in these different changing environments and we have to be adaptive. We have to change our beliefs uh, to best lead us to be successful in that environment. Another point that you can see that's revolutionary here is that it emphasizes individualism. And so just as I said, uh, at that time in American life, there was a lot of emphasis on individualism and how you could be successful and practical. Well, this is trying to argue that each of us has a different environment the way we've grown up. And as a result of that, we have different sets of beliefs because we've all had to adapt to whatever our changing environment was. And so the final thing is that is to note that important link between these beliefs and behavior. And this leads to the emphasis on behavior in psychology that you see, for instance, in behaviorism. So in the 20th century, we're going to get people like John Watson and B.F. Skinner who basically say, we're not interested in cognitions. They're kind of useless to us. We're not really interested in thinking. What we really are interested in is behavior because behavior is what ultimately this is all about. And so already the metaphysical club members were emphasizing behavior um, and making it pretty easy then for behaviorism to sprout up in the 20th century. So now let's focus on William James and talk a little bit about his bi biography and um, and then we'll get into his contributions to psychology. So William James was born in 1842 in New York City. He was the eldest child in a family that was very wealthy by the virtue of the fact that his grandfather had given um, or invested a lot of money in the building of the Erie Canal, which turned out to be a very important for the development of New York. Um, during his boyhood and adolescence, because his family was so wealthy, the entire family traveled throughout America and Europe because his father was always trying to find the best way to educate uh, the five children that he had. His father's name was Henry James Sr. And Henry James Sr. had grown up himself, of course, being very wealthy and privileged, but he always seemed to be suffering some sort of spiritual uh, problem. Um, after he had studied at the Princeton Theological Seminary for two years, he he felt really pre uh, pressed by their Presbyterian doctrine of predetermination, so he dropped out. And despite the fact that he had this inherited fortune, he just worried acutely about the lack of having a meaningful vocation, especially after he got married to Mary Walsh in 1840. His life reached a dramatic crisis in 1844, and it's interesting is that he later wrote about this crisis, and then in turn, his son had a similar crisis. So let me just tell you about Henry James's crisis. The father vividly remembered his own crisis as follows. It says, one day, having eaten a comfortable dinner, I remained sitting at the table after the family had disappeared, idly gazing at the embers in the grate, thinking of nothing, and feeling only the exhilaration incident to a good digestion, when suddenly, in a lightning flash, as it were, Fear came upon me and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. To all appearances, it was a perfectly insane and abject terror without a sensible cause and only to be accounted for to my perplexed imagination by some damned shape squatting invisible to me within the precincts of the room and raying out from his fetid personality influences fatal to life. The thing had not lasted 10 seconds before I felt myself a wreck that is reduced from a state of vigorous, joyful manhood to one of the most hopeless infancy. So it sounds like a very major panic attack in today's parlance. He went to seek doctor's help afterwards. And for two years, he was prone to anxiety attacks and had this constant sense that 
um, the, that his existence was in question. And then he came upon a Swedish mythical philosopher named Emanuel Swedenborg, who had written about such attacks as his own uh, that he had also had himself. And therefore, James started reading everything that Swedenborg talked about, and this helped him recover from his breakdown. And finally, he found his vocation, which was that he became a promoter of Swedenborgian philosophy. So this rare mystic from Sweden and taught, taught, gave lectures and wrote books about it. Now, keep in mind, he didn't even need to do any of this because the family was so well off. This was just something that, um, you know, <laughs> he wanted to do. So he felt like he, had, he was making a contribution. The other thing, though, was he was really in, uh, sort of obsessed with was the education of his children. He he had his oldest son, William, and then after that he had um, another son named Henry Jr. Henry Jr. turned out to be a famous novelist. So if you've ever heard of Henry James, who wrote things like The Portrait of a Lady, um, Henry James went on to move to England and is sometimes considered a British writer, although he was actually American. He had another son named Garth, then a son named Robertson, and finally, the fifth child was a girl named Alice. And he wanted to make sure that all five of them got the best education possible. So they would go from private school to a private tutor, and then they would go over to Europe, and they would travel to Italy and to France and to visit different museums with different tutors. Um, wherever they would go, the children were always allowed to have conversations with the adults. They were always encouraged to engage an active discussion to express their opinions freely and to defend them, to defend those uh, against any opposition through argument. Um, so people who were guests to the house were always sort of amazed that these children were so lively involved in all the discussions at the table, no matter what their age was. And as I mentioned to you um, in a previous lecture, some of the transcendentalists actually came and were guests at the James house. And there was other famous people from Harvard and so on that would come to have dinner and so these kids growing up in the James household had these really interesting discussions with great thinkers of their time. So as a result of this, it's probably not such so much a surprise that William James himself came out um, to be a great thinker, that his brother became a great novelist. The other two didn't seem to as excel as much as their older brothers did. Um, and they didn't seem to be as happy. They had a the youngest sister, Alice, Alice probably suffered the most of all because she was a girl in the sense that she seemed to be extremely gifted and, and uh, could write very well, but she just wasn't given the same kind of opportunities that other people were given, especially after the Civil War was over. She was also kind of chronically uh, an invalid and she had lots of um, different aches and pains and so on. She produced a, a fascinating diary of her life that did eventually get published, but she died of cancer at the age of 43. And so it's a really interesting picture if you ever go look at Alice James's diary of what it was like to be um, a woman in the mid 19th century in America. Well, anyway, the two oldest sons, William and Henry, were quite successful. Now, let's go ahead and just show you some pictures of William himself. There he is dashing at the age of 23 in 1865. There he is as a professor now in 1892, he's 50. And 1906, he's 64. He actually died at the age of 68. Um, so let's just go ahead and just highlight a little bit more about his life. So I mentioned he had this sort of unconventional childhood growing up in the U.S. and spending lots of time in Europe. And you might have noticed if you read his writings, he makes mention of paintings and museums all over the place as if uh, he's been to all of these things that he talks about in his textbook. He studied chemistry, physiology, and medicine at Harvard in the 1860s. Um, each of these had different kinds of success. At one point, his father was encouraging him to become a doctor, and so that's why he was taking the courses that he was taking. In 1865, he was given an opportunity to be a research assistant, much like the way Charles Darwin was when he went on the Beagle. William James got to go on an expedition to the Amazon, and at the Amazon, collect specimens and uh, make observations and so on. So it helped him to be a good observer and a naturalist of the environment. Um, so things are going pretty well, but he just really had a hard time figuring out what he was going to do in his life. That is, he's now he's about 28 or so, and in 1870 he has another he has a crisis just like his father did. Um, so this crisis that he had 
um, was a sort of a similar panic attack, and he wrote about it himself. He said, um, whilst in a state of philosophical pessimism and general depression about my prospects, I went one evening into a dressing room in the twilight to procure some article that was there when suddenly there fell upon me without any warning, just as if it came out of the darkness, a horrible fear of my own existence. Simultaneously, there arose in my mind the image of an epileptic patient whom I had seen in the asylum, a black-haired youth with greenish skin who used to sit all day on one of the benches, moving nothing but his black eyes and looking absolutely non-human. That shape am I, I felt, potentially. Nothing that I possess can defend me against that fate, if the hour for it should strike to me as it struck for him. There was such a horror of him and such a perception of my own merely moment, momentary discrepancy from him that it was as if something hitherto sold solid within my breast gave away entirely and I became a mass of quivering fear. And after this, the university was changed. The universe was changed for me for altogether. So you can see this is very much like what his father went through. And in fact, because of all this worry and this panic attack, he himself uh, had to take some time to recover. And he started reading a lot and reading different philosophers and getting away from sort of this medical career that he'd been going for. And it was from reading um, some different philosophers that he actually started to get interested in psychology. And what happened was in 1872, he was offered to teach a course in physiology at Harvard. But at that time, because of his background, he had been training for physiology as a doctor. But he was able to convince the, the uh, administration to also let him teach philosophy and psychology. It helped that the president of Harvard was, again, a good friend of his father. And the president of Harvard would actually have dinner over at their house quite a bit. So this is the way you get a job back then, was you just had to know the, father, the president of the, of the university. But well, anyway, he offers to teach this course in physiology. He ends up being there for the rest of his career, being a professor at Harvard. But as he keeps reading and teaching about physiology, he's also reading about this new psychology, and he's really taken with the things that Wundt and other people are doing, and he just becomes very well read in everything going on in philosophy. He can study, he can read German, by the way. Partly this is because of his background as a kid, that he had traveled to Germany a lot. He could speak German fluently, he could speak French. So he was able to read the writings of these German and French philosophers and these new psychologists that were doing this kind of work. And he's offered a contract in 1878 to write a textbook for the American audience, because there hadn't been one yet, called The Principles of Psychology. And this dovetailed very well with the fact that the university was allowing him now to teach psychology in courses at the university. So he just took his lecture notes and trying to turn them into a textbook. He was supposed to get this whole book done in a couple of years, but as you can see here, it actually took him 12 years to write The Principles of Psychology while he was doing this. and then. As soon as he turned it in, it was a great hit. Everybody thought it was a fantastic book, but they also realized that it was too big for most introductory psychology students. So he published The Briefer Course in 1892, which is the book that I'm having you read for this course. A couple other things is during this time um, in the late 1880s to the 1890s, he's really at this time really embracing psychology full on. And he ends up becoming the president of the American Psychological Association twice, once in 1894 and another time in 1904. So he definitely promotes psychology at Harvard by setting up a laboratory at Harvard in psychology, by having the first major textbook in American psychology that turns out to be one of the best books ever written on psychology. So it gets translated in other parts of the world as well. And then also becomes the president of the American Psychological Association. So he's doing a lot to promote psychology in the 1890s. But unfortunately, he moved on into philosophy in, 18, in the 1890s. That is, he got sort of bored with psychology, if you could believe it. So after he wrote that book, The Briefer Course in 1892, he felt like he knew everything there was to know about it, had given some lectures about it now for maybe you know, 15 years, and was just frankly now interested more in philosophy. So he actually moved into philosophy and just taught courses in philosophy in the 1890s and the, for the rest of his career. He always maintained an interest in psychology. As you can see, he still was a president of the EPA in 1904, but it just sort of became less and less of an important thing to him. 
He was really interested in psychoanalysis. And so in 1909, when uh, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung visited the United States, he did uh, go and meet with them because he wanted to meet these famous psychoanalysts and talk about psychoanalysis with them. So he made it to that in 1909, um, even though he wasn't feeling very well because the very next year in 1910, he died from heart disease. Um, and they call it back then a weak heart while he was on a hike in his mountain home in upstate uh, Vermont, I think it was, or New Hampshire. Um, that meeting that he had in 1909 with Freud and Jung, there's, uh, we're going to talk about this in some more detail in a moment, but here's an interesting photograph. You can see um, that on the front row, if you kind of start from the left in the front row, you see there's a guy with a mustache and there's a guy with a big dark beard. This guy's named, that guy is named Titchener. We're going to be talking about Titchener uh, soon um, in another week or two. But the guy with the hat that he's holding there and the kind of grayish beard, that is William James. So you can see he's the third person from the left in the front row. We keep moving towards the middle. You can see that in the very middle, uh, there's a guy holding a hat there that has a white beard and has no hair, he's bald. He's G. Stanley Hall, and he's the person who actually arranged to have Freud and Jung come over and meet these Americans. Um, Freud is then next to him. You can see Freud there. And then that younger man who's kind of taller than Freud in the front row is Carl Jung. And so this was a, an important meeting in 1909 where these American psychologists finally got to get an idea of what this stuff about psychoanalysis was actually like. Now, Let's talk a little bit about James's psychology. And the psychology I want to talk about here um, is known as functionalism. Okay. And I think you'll start to understand why it's called functionalism because of this heavy influence of evolution, evolutionary theory, and Darwin on the way that James and the other people of his metaphysical club thought about things. The focus in for James always, and the focus of people who call themselves functionalists, was what is the biological significance or function of behavior? So they would look at all the different behaviors of any animal or any human and say, why does that animal do that? Why does that human, uh, you know, forget things? Or why does that human uh, have this particular social relationship? And the idea was to kind of trace it back to Darwin to come up with an evolutionary explanation for it. So it was very much influenced by Darwin's work. And you can view modern Evo psych, those of you who've had evolutionary psychology, um, as being very similar to what this functionalism was, that a lot of modern day evolutionary psychologists ask a very similar question. They're saying, why do we do the things that we do socially? Or why do we do these things mentally? And the idea is that perhaps they re re reflect adaptations from the evolutionary history of humans and their ancestors. So Darwin and all of his writings is, are very much influenced by Darwin's work. Um, and they think then about what the adaptive significance of the behaviors are. Another thing about James and functionalism is perhaps because their question was more focused on the biological significance, is that they had less emphasis on experimentation. So there was less emphasis, less emphasis on the proper methodology to do an experiment or how to have a laboratory set up to look at different kinds of perception. So this is actually quite a contrast to what was going on in Germany with Wundt. You know, Wundt was the ultimate experimentalist and he had, you know, his psychology was defined by the way he did his experiments. James just really wasn't that interested in experiments. He was much more interested in anecdotal information. He was interested in experiments as evidence, but he himself just didn't like to do experiments. He was also really not interested so much in mental structures. So um, that is, he's not so interested in just like doing like Ebbinghaus stuff and going, um, you know, how, how does memory actually work in the sense of trying to figure out, you know, what the structures are for memory. But he's more interested in their operation, like the act of remembering. So there's much more of an emphasis on behavior again and doing things. So remembering, forgetting, um, learning. And in fact, learning became a very important interest of, of his research as well, or his writings, I should say, because he didn't really do much research on it. Um, in fact, he was really interested in applying this to learning for teachers. And so he spent a lot of time talking to teachers and giving lectures to teachers about how they could benefit from a knowledge of psychology and learning about things that were, for instance, covered in his textbook. Um, so 
educational psychology and the rise of paying attention to things in teaching comes from this interest in functionalism that William James was really a proponent of. I want to give you a picture here of uh, what it looked like in the 1890s at Harvard. So this is the Harvard Psychology Laboratory that James would have set up. And you can see uh, the different kinds of things that are in there. There are objects in the cases like brains and different heads and skulls. You can see there's a bunch of journals probably back there in the corner. The guys are all sitting there around the table. Notice they're all men because Harvard was a university for just men, a college just for men. Um, they look like they're on laptops, but they're doing something else. They, they have some sort of board in front of them that's probably uh, presenting different kinds of stimuli. There's a clock on a table to the left, and that probably was the way that they could measure reaction times on that clock. Um, and there's different other kinds of apparatuses on the, on the table over there onto the far left. So this is the kind of thing, if you wanted to say you were a psychologist, um, you would have this kind of equipment in your laboratory. And um, the, I think that the person who's sitting at the far end of the table, he looks to me to be uh, a, a young psychologist that James had come over from Germany to take over the lab because James himself really couldn't be bothered in the laboratory. He wasn't really interested in all these apparatuses. Um, the guy over there at the far end of the table, I think, is Hugo Munsterberg. Um, Munsterberg, we're going to talk about Munsterberg in several weeks from now, he becomes a, a famous applied psychologist. But Munsterberg was originally brought over because James was just getting tired of psychology by this point and wanted to have somebody else run the laboratory. As I said, James went on to really focus much more on philosophy. And you can see these are some uh, uh, documents that come from James's classes. You can see the syllabus is kind of like the electronic course profile for one of his courses, Philosophy 3, that was given to um, first years, it looks like. Um, and you can see that it covers things like what philosophy is, pragmatism as our methods. You can see that he's taking Charles Peirce's ideas of pragmatism and teaching them right there in the curriculum. Uh, he's got Kant's arguments for idealism, post-Kantian idealism, pluralistic panpsychism, that material objects are for themselves also, um, facts, laws, and ultimate elements. So it's just really interesting to kind of see the kind of things that they would cover in a course like that, and that William James would be the professor for that. On the right, you can actually see these are exam questions from another course he taught, Philosophy 9. And so you would show up to the exam, and this is exactly what the questions would be. Discuss the self-transcendency implied in knowing. Compare that involved in your thought of Memorial Hall with that involved in hand, sapolio, advertisement, etc. Um, number three, why did W.J., Williams James, attach so much importance to conjunctive relations? Um, being has to be begged in all philosophies to explain this. Uh, seven, compare the popular, the scientific, and the absolutist conception of cause. Which did W.J. favor? So you, you know, got to know what the professor favors. Uh, so these are, gives you kind of an idea of the way uh, James went in his later years after he sort of passed up psychology. I should also just mention that another thing that really James became interested in was um, looking at the spiritual world and he was you know, one of the first people to actually study the psychology of religion and he wrote a book called the varieties of religious experience in which he sort of reviewed why people might be religious what psychological benefit they get out of being religious um, and it was a very thoughtful interesting book and he really kind of created this field called the psychology of religion from that one textbook he was also interested in um, the paranormal and so he was a skeptic. He knew that there were a lot of people doing seances in New York and in Boston. And they said they could talk to people after they had died and talk to their spirits and so on. And so he kept an open mind. He wanted to see if these people might actually have um, some special talent, some way of connecting to the other world. And so he would actually attend seances and study the person running the seance to understand what it was that they were doing and try to make sense of it. Um, so like I said, he investigated, it kind of gave it sort of scientific uh, questioning as he looked at it. Uh, he didn't, I don't think in the end he was ever actually convinced of anything that he saw, but he stayed open-minded about it enough um, in the 1890s and the early 1900s to investigate these psychic phenomena. So very interesting range of topics. I am looking forward to uh, reading your papers that you've written about the chapters in his briefer course, and I'm hoping that 
um, some of the things that you wrote about now connect better to uh, his background and, and the way that he approached psychology. Uh, so we'll come back to that kind of stuff uh, a little bit more when we have our in-class discussion or uh, about your, your papers. So I want to turn now to some of the other functionalists that follow James. Some of these people were directly taught by James. Others were influenced by James's teachings through his books. Um, and one of those first people I want to talk about is G. Stanley Hall. So G. Stanley Hall was born in Massachusetts. He did his undergraduate work at Williams College, and he subsequently went to Union Theological Seminary. He became a minister, but soon went on to pursue further studies. He studied philosophy and theology in Germany from 1868 to 1871, and then he preached and taught for a few years. So here's another one of those psychologists who began his career actually as a preacher. In 1878, he was awarded the first American PhD in psychology, after studying under William James at Harvard. So he was basically William James's first PhD student and a pretty remarkable person to have as his first PhD student. His dissertation topic was on the muscular perception of, pay, of space and it used the facilities of a physiological laboratory in order for him to do his work. The next year he returned to Germany and on his second visit, he went to Leipzig and became the first American to work with William Wundt in his new lab. In fact, Hall was there in December of 1879 when the first experiment was conducted there. So interestingly, PhD done in a physiology lab, ends up going over and seeing Wundt and is there when Wundt starts his first experiment in 1879. Hall returned to the US in 1880 at the age of 36, he had no prospects, he was heavily in debt, and after he gave some lectures that earned him some attention, he received an appointment to the new Johns Hopkins University as a lecturer in 1882, and he was given there a small, privately owned laboratory in 1883, so he actually had to fund his lab himself, but was given some space. After 1884, he held the title of Professor of Psychology and Pedagogics, and pedagogics is basically the, um, the, the discipline of education. And the laboratory was moved to rooms elsewhere on campus. His students at Hopkins included four people who later became presidents of the American Psychological Association. These included James McKean, McKean Cattell, John Dewey, Joseph Jastrow, and Edmund Stanford. So we're going to talk about Cattell in a, and, uh, in a few lectures from now. John Dewey we'll be talking about just a little bit later in this lecture. Jastrow and Stanford were also important people. We don't, get, we don't have enough time to actually cover them in this course. He left Hopkins in 1888 to become the first president of Clark University, which opened in 1889 and had an exclusive emphasis on graduate education. That is, they were only going to do postgraduate work, only give master's and PhD degrees, and the biggest thing that they did there, the biggest production of PhDs, was actually in psychology. So Clark University quickly became the, became the chief source of the first American PhDs in psychology. And Hall and his colleagues, at least two of them had actually earned their PhDs under, at Hopkins under his guidance, they started to account for all of the American PhDs that were granted prior to 1893. So you have this little link to William James, who, like I said, um, then taught G. Stanley Hall. Then G. Stanley Hall really produced a lot of those PhD students in the next decade. And so, yes, they all get traced through back to William James, but it was really Hall that was turning them out. Um, anyway, uh, this, in, this work that he did there at Clark University um, and really taking hold of it as being like this first place where psychology was really going to have a big influence in the curriculum um, led him to also have other leadership roles in psychology. And that is, for instance, while he was still at Johns Hopkins, he established the American Journal of Psychology in 1877, uh, sorry, 1887. And this was the first American journal of the new psychology. So it's called the American Journal of Psychology. And after he went to Clark, he was the person who said, you know, we should have our own um, scientific organizations for psychologists. And it was the American Psychological Association, which began in 1892, the first major national um, psychological association. And he was the first president. And then in company with William James, he was the only other person that was ever elected twice to be the president. The second election was in 1924, which happened to be the year that he died. 
so he didn't actually live long enough to give his second presidential address. Hall was also that person responsible for bringing Freud and Jung to visit Clark in 1909. So if you go to Clark University's homepage, um, you'll see that Clark University still is there today. And like I said, he was the first president of that university. And they even have a nice tribute there on, his, on their page to G. Stanley Hall um, and, and the work that he had done in establishing psychology and making it a, a fundamental uh, big important role of that particular university. Now, I want to go ahead and talk a little bit more about his um, psychology and the kind of things that he uh, believed in, in terms of like what was his main contribution to the discipline of psychology as a science. He's largely responsible for beginning developmental psychology. Um, back then it was called genetic psychology, but if you see genetic psychology in older books, it's the same thing as developmental psychology. And he's really like the person who popularized it and made it like its own sub-discipline of psychology. So he's really our first big developmental psychologist. He relied a lot on the theory of recapitulation. And this was that idea that I've talked about in a previous lecture that's really closely identified with a German biologist named Ernest Haeckel. And that famous slogan of Ernest Haeckel was, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. And so the idea here is that recapitulation, that means to restate, review, or summarize, and ontogeny refers to an individual's development, and phylogeny is the evolutionary development of a species. So Haeckel's possession, he Haeckel's possession can be stated as follows, that ontogeny is the short and rapid recapit recapitulation of phylogeny during its own rapid development, and an individual repeats the most important changes in form evolved by its ancestors during their long and slow paleological development. So in terms of embryology, um, like if you're looking just at the embryo, the 19th century thinker could see that at the first stage of ontogeny, the human brain resembled that of a fish. Then at a second stage, it resembled that of reptiles. At a third, that of the birds. A fourth, that of the mammals. And in order to finally elevate itself to this uh, human kind of brain. Now, Hall's version of this principle was informed, though, by the fact that he was deeply religious. So not only did he believe that an individual's course of development was a summary of the entire uh, history of that species, but he also believed that there was a historical order in which religions had emerged that was indicative of their developmental status. That is, he believed that the religions of the world also had sort of a evolutionary history, and there were more primitive religions and more developed religions. And thus, he said that the religious sentiments of a small child are particularly attuned to those kind of more primitive religions. So a child is going to be more interested in pagan nature worship, miracles, and myths. However, the more developed mind will find itself to be more open to a kind of religious sensibility that Hall thought was more appropriate for an older person. He said, this whole field of psychology is connected in the most vital way with the future of religious beliefs in our land. The new psychology, which brings simply a new method and a new standpoint to philosophy, is, I believe, Christian to its root and center. And its final mission in the world is to flood and transfuse the new and vaster conceptions of the universe and the man's place in it with the scriptural sense of unity, rationality, and love. The Bible is slowly being revealed as man's great textbook in psychology, dealing with him as a whole, his body, his mind, and will, in all the larger relations to nature and society, which has been misappreciated simply because it is so deeply divine. That something may be done here to aid this development is my strongest hope and belief. So he was really strongly taking this idea from evolutionary theory, from Darwin and from other evolutionary biologists, re recapitulation, and linking it with religion. And he believed that when people understood themselves as basically at the pinnacle of a long evolutionary process, they could start to appreciate their destiny, which is that they're going to continue to evolve and progress into something even higher. He believed that people must most fit to lead in this endeavor were the people who were most in, uh, fit to lead this endeavor to get us to our higher state of being were research psychologists because they could provide the means for self-knowledge and self-control. Psychology was instrumental to the attainment of the perfect social order, and the psychologist occupied a social role consistent with the special obligations of the field. So you see, research psychologists are going to lead the way. By the way, you might ask, what's the evidence for all of this recapitulation? 
Well, he pointed the childhood to childhood pleasures and fears. He said that a child's love of the beach could be traced to that time when our evolutionary ancestors had lived in the sea. Similarly, a child's fear of snakes was a relic of ancient times when it was much more realistic to fear snakes and other reptiles. And then great emphasis was laid on playing uh, on play as illustrating these kind of principles. Children's games were regarded as relics of what once in our history were adaptive activities. The child revels in savagery in its tribal, predatory, hunting, fishing, fighting, roving, playing proclivities. So that's how he's showing evidence from development for his particular theory. Now, the way he collected evidence wasn't just through anecdote. He was the person who first really started using questionnaires to collect data in large groups for children. And so um, his co workers would gather data about child activities through these questionnaires. Beginning in 1882, he undertook soon after the opening of the Boston schools in September to make out a list of questions suitable for obtaining an inventory of the contents of the mind of children of average intelligence on entering the primary schools of that city. The problem first in mind was strictly practical. What may children be assumed to know and have seen by their teachers when they enter school? Kindergarten teachers were employed by the hour to question three children at a time. And they originally got some data from 200 children, which showed that there was next to nothing of any value that the knowledge of which was safe to assume had happened before they got into school. So he's basically saying, these kids get to school, they don't nothing. And because of this impoverished nature of these, their knowledge, he stressed the importance of acquainting them all with nature and myth, a task which parents should accept. So remember, he's focusing on an urban area, Boston, and he's saying these kids growing up in Boston at this time really don't have enough contact with nature and myths and stuff. So they're not properly recapitulating the ontogeny of our species. So we need to start off right away by teaching them about nature and mythology. His questionnaire method, by the way, turned out to be really influential. This method was taken up by many other students of child development, and soon there was a vast amount of data that had been collected. There was this whole movement called the Child Study Movement that was really popular in the 1890s, and in, across the United States there were many teachers, many educators, many parents that were interested in collecting information about what children knew. And one of the consequences of this was a bond that started to form between psychologists in these different cities who had been trained in how to do questionnaires and the teachers that they're working with. And that this bond is one of the reasons why in, um, in America especially, you get this kind of connection between education and psychology. So in fact, a lot of times you'll find the branch called educational psychology in the school of education or the college of education. So where teachers are being educated, that's typically where you'll find a whole branch of psychology just devoted to education. All right, the last big contribution I wanna talk about, about um, G. Stanley Hall's work, is this book that he published in 1904 called Adolescence. He published this book when he was 60 years old. It was a two volume book and it had a very long title. It wasn't just called Adolescence. It was called Adolescence, Its Psychology and Its Relations to Physiology, Anthropology, Sociology, Sex, Crime, Religion, and Education. And this, you can see, this is just volume one, but there was a volume one and volume two, and they totaled 1,373 pages, and they covered almost everything. And there was a lot of moralizing thrown in there, you know, that is um, G. Stanley Hall just saying what was correct and what wasn't correct. Um, and he called for greater naturalness by showing great respects for the tendencies of, that appear in adolescence. Um, but the other things he would say uh, would kind of just reflect the prejudices of the times, what they thought boys and girls should be doing. He listed in this book five developmental stages. He uh, one of the first people to ever talk about him this way. He talked about infancy, childhood, youth or pre-adolescence, adolescence, and adulthood. According to him, the child had to move through these successive phases and assimilate the knowledge, skills, and social behaviors that animals do, just like animals do. Um, this long period of dependency in the human child was a mean to flower during this transition to independence at adolescence. So the whole point of adolescence is that you are getting away from the dependence on the parent. His book talked about um, his own strong feelings about what was wrong with education at all the levels, including all the way up to colleges and universities. 
In essence, he argued that education was too bookish when it was guided by philosophers, but too unscientific when it dealt with the practical arts. He included discussions on the education of adolescent girls and ethnic psychology and pedagogy. He had one chapter that showed his admiration for adolescents if they could be but made free to live as their evolutionary status demands. He argued that the lofty characteristics of the adolescent's mind and spirit must not be crushed by a pedantic teaching of modern science. The sources of adolescent interest in the natural world is stirred by space and time, stars, sun and moon, twilights, clouds, wind, frost and fire. These events have stimulated man's imagination and aspiration in ages past, and the physical view of them should not be taught first from the standpoint of modern science, but according to the myths and metaphors which will catch the adolescent's attention and then stir interest in the modern discoveries of science. So very lofty uh, notions there. (coughs) He later condensed this book into a new edition that could be sold to teachers and parents, and it became quite influential in child-rearing practices. And so you saw magazines that would adopt articles about what G. Stanley Hall had to say in this book and so on. His views were later criticized by Thorndike, who we'll cover in a couple of weeks, um, who pointed out lots of problems with Hall's theory. But until we get to that, Hall really dominated uh, for a couple decades there, the way kids were being raised, at least in the United States. Now, I say here he's a functionalist, and again, he was directly taught by William James. He definitely is taking into account evolutionary psychology. Um, you can see here, he, one of his quotes is he's known for is, adolescence is when the very worst and the best impulses in the human soul struggle against each other for possession. So, you know, just much like the way the metaphysical club talked about how beliefs fight with each other until one is the most practical and leads to the best behavior, G. Stanley Hall believed that, you know, our adolescence is really about these impulses that are struggling uh, and to see who's going to win out in terms of our behavior during adolescence. Now, as I said, one of the uh, final things I wanted to point out here was that um, Hall was known for the fact that he, um, as a leader, organized the um, trip of a bunch of, uh, uh, well, uh, the trip of, of Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud to come to the United States. And you can see this is that photo that I showed you earlier. This one's been numbered so you can actually identify the people in the pictures. But again, seven and eight here in the picture are Freud and Jung. And then six right there in the middle is G. Stanley Hall. So he's the organizer. And this is actually at Clark University, the university where he was the president. And then again, number three, you can see there, there's William James. Um, he must have had a lot of special FaceTime here with Freud and Jung. And so here's another photo where you can see them up close. Um, there in the front, we have Freud on the left. We have G. Stanley Hall in the middle and Carl Jung on the right. Um, in the back are different um, psychoanalysts. The person in the middle, Ernest Jones, um, ended up being a, an important biographer and editor for uh, Sigmund Freud and a lot of the books that were published in English. Um, so anyway, again, just wanted to point out this important milestone in history of psychology of bringing over these psychoanalysts to talk to the American psychologists and seeing what they had in common to hear their ideas and so on. So it's kind of a very forward way of thinking about things. Because G. Stanley Hall had such an impact on education of that time period and had so much importance on, on, uh, on children and so on, it's interesting, I a few years ago found this uh, online that in Vanderburg County, Indiana, there was actually a school there that was um, um, named after G. Stanley Hall. So you can see here it says, in 1915, an addition was added to the school and the school was renamed Stanley Hall School after G. Stanley Hall. Um, and as far as I know, I don't think Stanley Hall ever went to Indiana, um, but he, in this state, was still regarded by a lot of teachers as an important educator. And so they named uh, this school after him, a psychologist. It says here, in 1972, unfortunately, the school was closed and raised, all except for the gym, so that building doesn't actually exist anymore. But the remaining portion of the building now houses the Stanley Hall Enrichment Center, an alternative education program for high school students. So there you go. Our next functionalist uh, is John Dewey, lived from 1859 to 1952. Now, John Dewey did his undergraduate work at the University of Vermont, where physiology attracted his greatest interest, and then he did a PhD in philosophy at Johns Hopkins, graduating in 1884, and who was his advisor? G. Stanley Hall. 
Then in 1894, he joined the University of Chicago, where he remained for 10 years. And at Chicago, he was the chair of the Department of Philosophy, Psychology, and Education. From 1904 until 1930, he was at Teachers College in Columbia University in New York City. Now, his famous work that he did in when he was at the University of Chicago, and what gives him a lot of um, the a lot of uh, intellectual credit is given to functionalism, his development of functionalism through this paper, was a paper that he published in 1896 called the Reflex Arc Concept in Psychology. Now, the reflex arc is this whole idea that we see a, have a stimulus and that there's a response. And this is a very old idea. It goes all the way back to at least Descartes. And it's very elementary and mechanic, me- mechanistic in the idea that we kind of like learn these stimulus-response relationships throughout the world. But in this article, Dewey criticized this concept and said that it really didn't work. It's not a very good way of understanding how um, we really understand the world. He argued that this reflex was inappropriately understood as a stimulus followed by a central process followed by a response. The true fact of the matter, he said, was that the sensory stimulus, central connections, and motor responses should be viewed not as separate and complete entities in themselves, but as divisions of labor, functioning factors, within the single concrete whole. So in order to illustrate what he meant, he talked about an example that James had used in his textbook, of a baby who sees a candle flame for the first time and extends his hand out to grasp it and then his fingers get burned. Now one might identify here that there are two stimuli and two responses in this situation. First, the candle flame is a stimulus that elicits the grasping out as a response. Then the intense heat of the flame is another stimulus that reflexively causes the response of a suddenly withdrawing the hand. So this analysis seems intuitively obvious, and yet it was precisely this sort of analysis that Dewey believed was wrong. He suggested that a stimulus does not elicit a response, but rather a stimulus is created by the organism through the act of paying attention to something. The candle does not exist as a stimulus until the organism sees it. Now, if this act, the seeing, stimulates another act, the reaching, It is because both of these acts fall within a larger coordination because seeing and grasping have often been so bound together to reinforce each other, to help each other out, that each may be considered practically a subordinate member of a larger coordination, said Dewey. The reflex art conception is false insofar as it regards the stimulus and the response as distinct elements in a chain of events, when in fact they are mutually influencing one another to the extent that they're basically a circuit. So for him, to interpret the stimulus and response as separate separate existences in a causal sequence is a characterization that is not real, but rather read into the process by the psychologist. So here is the way that he wanted it to be thought about. Um, What you can see here is the standard conception is given in A, up above. Notice that we have a stimulus that elicits a response, and this is directly through a connection that's symbolized by an arrow. When Dewey proposed, what Dewey was proposing was represented in B. Here the stimulus and response determine each other. What constitutes a stimulus depends on what you're doing at the time. The fact is that stimulus and response are, according to him, teleological distinctions, that is, distinctions of function, or part played with reference to reaching or maintaining an end. The relation between the stimulus and the response cannot be seen in isolation from the other activities of the organism of which it is a part, but it has to be understood in terms of its function and enabling the organism to achieve its goals. How you respond to a candle is going to depend on what you're doing at the moment. If you're trying to shed additional light on the situation, then you'll do one thing. If you're trying to just warm your hands, then you might do something quite different to the candle. So this paper, written in 1896, really anticipated 20th century developments that occurred much later and that we'll cover in future weeks. Um, He not only was pointing out a functional approach to this analysis of a psychological phenomenon, but he was also anticipating a criticism of behaviorism, because behaviorists ended up just being the SRs, the A that you see there. And he was basically saying, no, how you see a stimulus depends on what your goals are at the time and your needs and so on. And so you have to take that into account. And then also became quite one of the central tenets of Gestalt psychology that we'll talk near the, about at the, near the end of the semester. So that's his famous paper that he wrote on the reflex arc.
The other thing that Dewey is probably really well known by, and, and you can tell a little bit by looking at his biography of where he went after he left the University of Chicago. Remember, he then went to Teachers College at Columbia University and was there for 26 years, is his contributions to education. So like his PhD advisor, he was very much interested in development and in education. And his, he had a presidential address as the president of the APA in which he talked about how he thought psychology and education could go together. He pointed out in this address that teachers are strongly influenced by whatever psychological assumptions they make about their children and the education process. And he singled out two issues that he believed to be particularly important for teachers to understand. In the first place, children and adults are different in that the adult is already in possession of cognitive abilities that the child is only in the process of developing. Children are not like adults, only smaller. This was a very common belief in the 19th century. Children should be busy in the formation of a flexible variety of habits whose sole immediate criterion is their relation to full growth, rather than in acquiring certain skills whose value is measured by their reference to specialized technical accomplishments. What he is really arguing against is just this um, idea that all you have to do is take these empty vessels of children and just fill up their minds with all the stuff they need to know as adults. He's saying basically they don't have the cognitive capabilities for that. And so you have to take into account the growth of the, of the child's mind as you're teaching them, which I know that probably sounds obvious to you today, but over a century ago, this is actually sort of revolutionary to imagine that children didn't actually have fully functioning brains yet. So he challenged the whole idea, for instance, of formal disciplines that you had to master math or Latin or whatever it was at a young age and have the same knowledge base and it will work just like it would do for an adult. So he said he thought that the curriculum at the time and probably still is in some schools um, had an excessive use of logical analytical methods and assumed that children possess ready-made faculties of observation, memory, attention, etc. So he said, although the children are different from the adults in terms of the abilities they bring, they are similar to adults, to adults, he said in his second point, in that they want to achieve power and control. And they do this through the realization of their own personal ends and problems through their personal selection of the means and materials which are relevant, and through their personal adapt adaptation and application of what is thus selected. The problems on which the child works in school should not be rigidly set by others. They should at least be in part selected by the child. Children differ from one another in terms of what's relevant to them at any particular time, and the curriculum must pay attention to the particular context with, within it, which, within which, with, within how each individual child is going to live and learn. So this kind of notion that he's talking about to, uh, in his presidential address and saying that this needs to happen uh, in schools led him to be um, identified with this movement known as progressive education. And he became like sort of like their intellectual leader. Uh, advocates of progressive education developed this reputation for schools that imposed no discipline on pupils and allowed the children to study whatever they wanted. It's not exactly what Dewey was advocating, but somehow um, he became sort of aligned with these people. Um, he, he didn't believe that teachers had no responsibility. He thought that the teachers had a lot of responsibility, in fact, for providing their pupils with experiences that would be worthwhile. So he wasn't into like sort of a, um, you know, like a total uh, thing where the, the kids come in and you just let them go loose and let them decide what they're going to learn. You know, it says the teachers need to provide these valuable experiences. And here's a kind of a quote from his address. He says, traditional education did not have to face this problem. It could systematically dodge this responsibility. The school environment of desks, blackboards, a small schoolyard was supposed to suffice. There was no demand that the teacher should become intimately acquainted with the conditions of the local community, the physical, historical, economical, occupational, etc., in order to use them as educational resources. A system of education based upon the necessary connection of education with experience must, on the contrary, if faithful to its principle, take these things constantly into account. This tax upon the educator is another reason why progressive education is more difficult to carry on than was ever the traditional system. And so he kind of worked with these progressive educators trying to say, hey, you need to take into the account the community, 
your local culture, that kind of stuff. It all needs to be brought into the classroom. Um, and so he's not going to uh, agree to letting the kids just run the school and do whatever they want to do. He's trying to say, integrate all of their lives into the classroom so it'll help them develop. Um, and so that's basically how um, John Dewey is remembered and was very influential in the way education took place after that and how schools are conducted today. Our next functionalist is James Angel, or that's how I pronounce his name. It's probably not correctly pronounced there. But anyway, James Angel was born in Burlington, Vermont, and he was the son of um, the president of the University of Michigan and was, well, for a long time, that his father was the president of the University of Michigan. Anyway, there was a time there before Dewey went to Chicago where Dewey was at the University of Michigan, and while he was there, um, Angel actually uh, was influenced by Dewey, was a student of his, and ended up having at least a year of his graduate training there. It was during that year that he attended a seminar that was conducted by Dewey on James's newly published Principles of Psychology, and this seminar switched his primary interest from philosophy to psychology. Then the following year, Angel went to Harvard and became acquainted with James, and in the year 1892 to 1893, he was tra traveling and studying in Germany. He attended lectures by Ebbinghaus, and he started to prepare a doctoral dissertation on Kant's philosophy under the supervision of a famous philosopher, Hans Weinger, but he never finished that. He had two master's degrees, one from Michigan in 1891 and another one from Harvard in 1892, but he never actually did get his PhD. Anyway, in 1893, he accepted an instructorship at the University of Minnesota and stayed there for only one year. In 1894, he accepted a position at the University of Chicago that was offered to him by his former teacher, Dewey. He was 25 years old at the time, and Dewey was 10 years his senior. Angel, Dewey, and their colleagues were all highly productive and influential at Chicago. It was in 1896 that Dewey had published that article on the reflex arc, but in 1904, Angel published the very popular book, Psychology, an Introductory Study of the Structure and Functions of Human Consciousness. And as I mentioned, Dewey eventually served as the APA president in 1899. Angel was the president of the APA in 1906. And when he was the president of the APA, his address was titled The Province of Functional Psychology. So this is where we finally, you know, I keep saying these guys are all the functionalist school. And so what kind of weaves the people together in this lecture is what he kind of said in this sort of manifesto in 1906, what the province of functional psychology was. And what he talked about in this address was the difference between functional and structural psychology. So that's how they were really defining themselves. They wanted to be the psychologists that weren't interested so much in structural psychology. And we're going to be talking about the structural psychologists later. Um, they best are probably represented by Wilhelm Wundt and his student, Titchener. But in his address, he made three major points. He said that, first of all, the, the, one of the main things that they wanted to do as functionalists is they wanted to understand the function of the mind rather than just have a static description of it. So they weren't really interested in like mental operations in isolation. They were more interested in how it all went together to form consciousness. So, um, so he's really kind of like trying to understand the function of the mind rather than just saying, you know, here's uh, what memory is, here's what this is. He's trying to put them all together to help us understand the function of the mind. That psychology should be a practical science, not a pure science. And so the functionalists believe that there are a lot of um, useful things that could come out of psychology that could benefit society. And so he was arguing that psychology had this sort of practical aspect to it, that, um, that psychology should always be looked upon as something that can help out society. And also that he believed that psychology should include research on animals, children, and atypical humans. So people, for instance, who had mental disorders and so on. Another thing that's kind of a unique thing about functionalism, besides just what um, he said in his AP address, is that functionalists also were really interested in motivation. So they talked a lot about goals. And you could see that, for instance, in Dewey's um, criticism of the, uh, the arc re uh, reflex there. He was saying that basically you have to take into account what your motivations are, and that's going to make a difference in what you pay attention to as a stimulus and how you're going to respond to it. So therefore, both mental processes and behavior are going to be important to the functionalists, and they're very influenced by 
Darwin's theory of evolution. So these are all things that um, Angel wrote about and kind of said, here's what functionalism is. And therefore, yeah, it's sort of like this manifesto, like I said, that their students who got their PhDs with any of these individuals adopted this This is their approach to psychology. So this is how they kind of think of psychology and how it would be then different from, for instance, what people who are coming from Wundt's lab would have thought about. You can see, by the way, how G. Stanley Hall was uh, a very unique individual in the fact that he had actually gotten his degree with James and then had gone over to Leipzig and happened to be there when Wundt was starting up his lab. He's one of the few individuals there who actually got influence from both of these different approaches. Um, but again, I think that you can kind of get an idea now how the functionalists are different and how they're going to carry through for the next few decades until the behaviorists really start to take control of things. I, I would also gather that you probably look at that slide that in front of you right now and you would say that that kind of describes today um, psychology pretty well, that, that that's pretty much how um, a lot of psychology is done. We're not so much saying that it's a practical science, although if you think about what our master's programs are, um, they usually are devoted to more practical things like organizational psych, um, health psychology, clinical psychology. Um, and you can certainly see that we don't do research just only on uh, uh, typical adults. We do it on animals, children, and so on. Um, but anyway, I, I think that this is sort of like a very uh, modern sort of viewpoint of psychology, what the functionalists are. So in some ways, we are functionalists today. But there will be a time coming soon after these functionalists in their area where they just disappear, that there really isn't much uh, of influence of their approach because they get beat out by the behaviorists. There's one last psychologist that I want to bring up today, and she can be put into the camp with the, the um, functionalists, and that is Mary Witten Calkins. Okay, so I want to talk about her, and I think this is the first woman we've talked about in the, in the course so far. Calkins was the oldest of five children. She grew up in Buffalo, New York, where her father was a Protestant minister. In 1881, the family moved to Newton, Massachusetts, where her father had just accepted a new um, congregation. After she completed high school, she attended Smith College, which was a women's college, and she graduated there in 1885. Shortly after her graduation, she accompanied her family on a year-long vacation in Europe. And after she came back, she was offered a position at Wellesley College, um, which is just west of Boston, where she was offered to teach Greek. And there she began her 40-year affiliation at Wellesley. So she was really hired there to teach Greek, uh, the classics in, in Greek. Now, after she had been there for about a year, though, they, uh, the college decided that they really would like to have a woman start to teach experimental psychology there. They didn't find any women available, though, on the job market who could teach psychology. So they decided to arrange the training for Calkins because of her success as a teacher and because she was also interested in philosophy. So they gave her this appointment that she would study experimental psychology for one year and kind of get up on it, you know, catch up on what was going on. Um, and this posed a problem, though, because none of the nearby institutions would accept women as graduate students at the time. So it was hard to go and get a postgraduate education as a woman at any of those colleges that were outside of Boston. She contacted... In 1899, the philosopher, sorry, 1890, she contacted the philosopher Josiah Royce and William James at Harvard, and she sought permission to attend their seminars. Both Royce, the philosopher, and James, the psychologist, said, yes, you can come to our seminars. But the president of Harvard, Charles Eliot, said no. But after intense lobbying by Royce and James and Calkin's father, Eliot changed his position and allowed Calkins to attend these graduate seminars at Harvard. He stipulated, however, that she attend without being officially enrolled as a Harvard student. He was concerned that her official enrollment would open the door to co-education at Harvard, which he strongly opposed. When it became known, though, that Calkins would be attending his James's seminar, all the male students in William James's seminar promptly withdrew, pr uh, promptly withdrew from the course, presumably in protest. I mean, literally every male in the seminar just quit the class. That left her all alone as the only student in the seminar with James, and James had just published his Principles of Psychology in 1890. Thirty years later, Calkins was remembering this experience. She said, I began the serious study of psychology with William James, 
Most unhappily for them, and most fortunately for me, the other members of his seminar in psychology dropped away in the early weeks of the fall of 1890, and James and I were left at either side of a library fire. The principles of psychology was warm from the press, and my absorbed study of those brilliant, erudite, and provocative volumes as interpreted by their writer was my introduction to psychology. <laughs> I just think that's just a, such an amazing story, given how much she had to go through in order to learn about psychology that she ended up getting the master himself alone uh, right after his book was published. Well, anyway, while she was attending these seminars at Harvard, she was also doing laboratory work at Clark University under the supervision of Edmund Sanford, who later became a president of the APA. And this too was done by special arrangement. She did research on dreams for her uh, degree, and under Sanders, uh, Sanford's supervision, she was, pre was presented at the first annual APA meeting in December of 1892 and published in a journal in 1893. She also published a paper on the association of ideas, stimulated by her work in James's seminar in 1892. In the fall of 1891, she returned to Wellesley, where she established a psychology laboratory the first in a women's college, and introduced experimental psychology into the curriculum. After about a year, she felt the need to continue her formal education, so she returned to Harvard again as a non-registered student. By now, though, James had moved on to <coughs> excuse me, philosophy on a full-time basis, and Hugo Munsterberg had taken over the psychology laboratory. Um, I've mentioned Hugo Munsterberg before. Um, he's going to be an important person when we talk about organizational psychology. But anyway, she came back, and now Hugo Munsterberg is running the laboratory. So she continued to work with Munsterberg while she taught at Wellesley. And then in, eight, in the year 1894 to 1895, she took an academic leave to devote herself full-time to work in the laboratory with Munsterberg. She was two months older. She got along very well with Munsterberg, and she was also fluent in German, in German so that really helped. He remained her mentor and advocated for her for many years. Strangely, they shared the same view of professional women. Both Munsterberg and Mary Witten Calkins believed that the primary female roles in society were mother and wife. Calkins pitied and condemned women who declined marriage to pursue a career, although she herself never married. She also disavowed feminism, believing that it was incompatible with the family. She said, wherein feminism makes encroachments into the institution of the family, I cannot follow it. And Munsterberg agreed, accepting the cases of a few exceptional women who should pursue careers instead of motherhood, I guess, presumably like Calkins. So they had a very sort of exceptional view of women in academia, that women really didn't belong there. They shouldn't be doing science. They should be at home being mothers and wives. Um, but, you know, there are a few exceptions there, like Mary Witten Calkins. They can come out and do this kind of stuff. By the way, here's Calkins' lab at Wellesley. This is what the apparatus look like. So you can see, again, there's that long table. Um, I don't really understand what the masks are for. It must have something to do with facial expressions. But you can see there's a bunch of different things there that are very strange. Now, while she was working with Munsterberg, she did do original research on the factors influencing memory. And during this research, she invented the still widely used paired associate technique that she could, you could use to study the influence of frequency, recency, and vividness on memory. For example, she would show her subjects a series of colors paired with numbers. Later, after several paired presentations, the colors alone were presented, and the subjects were asked to recall the corresponding numbers. And among other things, Calkins found that the frequency of occurrence facilitated memory more than recency or vividness, dis, vividness did. So this lecture began talking about um, the metaphysical club and how that led to James's thinking. And then we had this very important person, William James, whom, again, you've read um, much of his work now. You've read a lot of his chapters from the briefer course. And then you can kind of see what happened afterwards in terms of some of the students and followers of his kind of psychology, at least in the United States in America. And it's from this point on that American psychology really starts to take off. Like these kind of labs that you see here get duplicated for the next 20 years all over 
um, every major college and university, and that is everybody believed that you had to have psychology as a, a, a department on campus, and there should be a laboratory like this that would be used. This thing that we have today, where we all have our own individual laboratories, or there are several laboratories that we share, um, that's, of course, probably because of the size of a psychology department today. But back then, anybody who was an instructor, anybody who was doing research, would have just used this one laboratory as their main laboratory at their college or university. So we'll pick up with that at the next lecture, and um, I look forward to talking to you more about James's book chapters. Thank you.